One. Hello, my name is Jacob Halter and I'm a Life Scout with Troop 2. I started my scouting career as a Cub Scout here at First Presbyterian Church. I have had many great memories in Boy Scouts and I have created friendships that will last a lifetime. I am starting my Eagle Scout service project and I am doing something to give back to the First Presbyterian Church. You may have seen me playing with the praise band here at First Presbyterian Church. I'm grateful for this opportunity because it makes me happy to play music for others. It came to my attention that the audio slash visual station in the sanctuary needed some attention. Then computer and cables are not in a central location and are not properly stored and could be stolen. The area is also not very presentable. The audio station is an important part of all the music services at First Presbyterian, and I would hate to see it be damaged or stolen. With Pastor Neil's blessing, my Eagle Scout project is to have a new storage unit made and installed to protect the equipment. I am planning to have a storage unit made or purchased that will complement existing woodwork and two scouts will do the installation. I will oversee and manage the entire project to include raising funds. I estimate it will, I will need about $2,000. I am asking you today for any donation you can make to help complete my Eagle Scout service project and to give the church something that they need. You can make a check out to Troop 2 and put Jacob Halter Eagle Project on the subject line and mail to 1340 Murchison, El Paso, Texas, 79902. Or you can submit a donation through Troop 2's Venmo account at at Naomi hyphen T2ELP with Jacob Halter Eagle Project in the description. Any amount is appreciated. Thank you for your consideration and support for my Eagle Scout Service Project. Good morning, everybody. Today, I'll be reading A Giant Staircase to Heaven. Let's get started. Noah and his family lived in the land, and his children had children, and those children had more children, and then those children had even more. Well, you get the picture, until there were lots of people on earth once more. Now, back then, everyone spoke exactly the same language, so you didn't need to learn Swahili or Japanese or anything because you could say hello to anyone and they knew what you meant. One day, everyone was talking and they came up with an idea. Let's build ourselves a beautiful city to live in. It can be our home and we'll be safe forever and ever. Then they had another idea. And let's build a really tall tower to reach up to heaven. Yes, they said. We'll say, look at us up here, and everyone will look up at us. And we'll look down on them, and we'll know we are something. We'll be like God. We'll be famous and safe and happy, and everything will be all right. So they got to work. Brick by brick, the tower grew, higher and higher and higher, until it soared above the city, touching the sky. They built stairs in the tower to climb to the top. It was like a giant staircase to heaven. Look, they cheered. We're the ones. See what we can do with our very own hands. They were quite pleased with themselves. But God wasn't pleased with them. God could see what they were doing. They were trying to live without him. But God knew that wouldn't make them happy or safe or anything. If they kept on like this, they would only destroy themselves. And God loved them too much to let that happen. So he stopped their plans. One morning, they went to work as usual, but everything was different. Their words were all new and funny. You see, God had given each person a completely different language. Suddenly, no one understood what anyone else was saying. Someone could say, how do you do? And the other person thought they said, how ugly are you? It wasn't funny. You could be saying something nice like, such a lovely morning, and get a punch in the nose because they thought you said, Hush up, you're boring. You couldn't even say pardon to check if you'd heard right because no one understood that word either. It wasn't easy to work together after that, as you can only imagine. People were always quarreling and fighting and getting in a dreadful muddle and becoming grumpier and grumpier until at last they were all too cross to keep on building and just had to stop. After that, People scattered all over the world, which is how we ended up with so many different languages to this day. You see, God knew however high they reached, however hard they tried, 
People could never get back to heaven by themselves. People didn't need a staircase. They needed a rescuer. Because the way back to heaven wasn't a staircase. It was a person. People could never reach up to heaven. So heaven would have to come down to them. And one day, it would. All right. I hope everybody has a great week. See you next Sunday. The scripture today comes from Psalm 86. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble I call upon you for you to answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give you thanks, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For grace your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped and comforted me. Thank you. Let us pray. Lord, you have taught us in the scriptures that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word endures forever. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Two men both died on the same day and went to heaven. One was a pastor. The other was a taxi cab driver. The taxi cab driver reached heaven just a little bit faster than the pastor did, and when he got to the pearly gates, he introduced himself and was immediately welcomed with great fanfare and applause, and he was, and loud cheers, and then he was escorted to his heavenly mansion. Next in line was the pastor, who, having seen all of this, got pretty excited. So he introduced himself, and he was greeted with polite applause. And then he was shown to his heavenly apartment complex. This clearly wasn't what he expected. So at the earliest opportunity, he sought out St. Peter himself and asked if there had been some sort of a mix-up. You see, he said, I served God faithfully for 50 years, preaching every Sunday morning and taking care of my flock. And that taxi driver, I knew him. He was the worst driver in the entire city. What's the deal? Well, St. Peter calmly replied, look, Reverend, I don't know how things were in your congregation, but here in heaven, we go by results. When you preached to your congregation, people fell asleep and thought about what was for lunch. But when that taxi driver drove people around the city, they cried out to Jesus and prayed to God for mercy. We all, of course, want to be more effective in our prayers to God. How often do you find yourself saying things like, my thoughts and prayers are with you, or I'll pray about that. But then when you actually go to pray, the words struggle to come out right. Just like anything else, prayer is a skill that develops over time with experience, a lot of practice, and a little bit of study, too. 
In the Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus gave his followers a model prayer in the Lord's Prayer, which we say every Sunday. But in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, God gave us 150 model prayers, the book of Psalms. I want to use one of those Psalms today, Psalm 86, to give you a simple, easy-to-remember pattern that will, I hope, help shape your prayers and the words of those prayers and also help us understand what exactly it is we're doing when we pray to God. I like to call this pattern cat, like the household pet, but with less fur and five letters instead of three. So C-A-A-A-T. And when you use this pattern, it's okay to use your hand to keep your place in the prayer and also remember how many A's there are in between the C and the T. So C-A-A-A-T, cat. We'll start with C. C is for calling upon God or crying out to God. In the prayers that we teach our children, this is the dear God part of the prayer. Grown-ups sometimes like to call this the invocation, where we invoke God's name. In Psalm 86, this shows up in the first half of verse 1, where you would expect it to, right at the beginning of the prayer. The psalmist says, incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. But then he does this again. He calls out to God later in verse 6 and 7. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. So we learn from this that it's okay to invoke God's name more than just at the beginning of the prayer, as often as you like. It also doesn't matter how elaborately you invoke the name of God or how simply, whether you like to use the flowery language of poets and psalmists or your pastor who likes to say, gracious Lord and God, or whether you opt for something more simple like dear God or our Father in heaven. Sometimes it might be an anguished cry to God, God, help me. Sometimes it might be something as simple as calling an old friend. Hey, Jesus, let's talk. But what is important, not so much how you do it, but that you do invoke the name of God, that you do call out to God. Because without this part, you're essentially just talking to yourself. So that's C. A, or rather the first A, is for acknowledging who you are, where you are, how you are, your circumstances. And I don't mean like, dear God, it's me, Neil Locke, down here in El Paso, Texas, USA. You remember? On Earth, third planet from the sun? No. God knows all of that. Acknowledging yourself, who you are, is a reality check. You acknowledging in words what it is that you're experiencing, good or bad, what it is that led you to your knees in prayer. And if you're praying for someone else or for a circumstance in your community, that's okay too. You're still acknowledging where you are because prayer is always personal. If you are praying for someone else, you are acknowledging your relationship with that person or your concern over world events, or your sorrow over a friend who is suffering. In this portion of the prayer, you can also acknowledge your sense of helplessness, your lack of words, your frustration in the situation, not knowing what to do or what to say. But A is for acknowledging where you are and who you are in that moment. In Psalm 86, this happens in the second half of verse 1, where the psalmist says, I am poor and needy. It doesn't get more real of an acknowledgement than that. I am poor and needy. But then later on in verse 14, he elaborates more on his circumstances. He says, O oh God, the insolent rise up against me. A band of ruffians seeks my life and they do not set you before them. Notice that once again, the order of the elements is flexible and fluid. 
You don't have to do them in sequence. It helps because it makes sense, but you can always jump back and forth uh, between the elements as needed. All right, so C is calling out to God. A is acknowledging who you are. And the second A is also acknowledging, acknowledging who God is or how God is, the attributes of God that are relevant to your prayer. If your circumstances, which that was the first acknowledgement, are what drove you to your knees in prayer, then this second acknowledgement is why you chose to pray to God and not your kitchen sink or your dog. Although I suppose if you're dyslexic, it would make sense why you would pray to your dog. But either way, you pray to God for a reason because you believe things about God that you don't believe about your kitchen sink. The psalmist acknowledges that he is poor and needy. That's acknowledgement of self in verse 1. But then he goes on after that in verse 5 to acknowledge about God. You, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. And then he does it again in verse 10. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. So you've already laid out where you are. This is the part of the prayer, the second acknowledgement, where you acknowledge who God is. You can also, in this part of the prayer, acknowledge God's promises, both to you in previous experience, in Scripture, God's history with you in the past, this happens in verse 13 where the psalmist says, For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of shale. God, it's me. You love me. Remember, I'm one of your children. You walked with me in the past. And now I'm asking you to walk with me again. Reminding God of that relationship is also reminding yourself of that relationship and you might be asking at this point, why do I need to remind God who I am or who God is? Doesn't God already know those things? Yes, of course. But there is power in acknowledging things, in saying them out loud or putting them into words in your own mind. Grief and trauma counselors know this and have long taught that there can be no lasting recovery from serious trauma unless the pain is named and lived through. In the same way, we cannot truly put any real kind of faith or even hope in our prayers unless we have some kind of understanding or inkling of who it is that we are praying to. Not a perfect understanding, but at least some idea of why we might pray to God. If you believe that God is spiteful and evil and angry and vengeful, why would you pray to a God like that? But if you believe that God is good or loving or kind, able to help in some way, willing to help in some way, then say that in your prayer. Acknowledge that and let that belief permeate the words of your prayer. So, calling out to God, calling upon God's name, acknowledging who you are or how you are, and then acknowledging who God is or how God is. And then the third and final A, which is the fourth letter in our acronym, is asking God for help. Now, for some people, that part is really hard especially those who value strength and independence and rugged individualism and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, the kind of people who don't like to rely on anyone for help, let alone God. But for others, this part of the prayer is really easy, almost too easy. In fact, for some people, this is the only thing they ever pray to the exclusion of everything else. I like to call these Santa Claus prayers. Dear God, Give me this, give me this, give me this, give me this. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Amen. Whatever side of the fence you tend to fall on, using this pattern can help you achieve a balance in your prayers so that you don't get stuck in just asking for things, but you also don't neglect to ask for the things that you truly need. 
In our model psalm, the psalmist asks for help in several different places and in several different ways, several different times. He says, preserve my life. Be gracious to me. Gladden the soul of your servant. In other words, cheer me up, God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. I like that one. It's a prayer for education and enlightenment. Give strength to your servant. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see it and be put to shame. I really like that last request too. It sounds a little bit vindictive, but it's a good reminder that the Psalms are very human prayers from very human people. So, C is for calling upon God's name. A is for acknowledging who you are and how you are. A is for acknowledging who God is and how God is. A is for asking God to help you or in your situation. And finally, T. T is for thanking God for what God has done or is doing or will do or even just who God is. You see, gratitude is an important part of prayer, just like it's an important part of our lives and our relationships. A lot of times, I think we say in our hearts something along the lines of, well, I will give thanks to God when God actually fixes my situation, or when God actually does that thing that I want done. But that's a lot like getting a gift from someone and telling that person, hey, I'm only going to thank you for this gift if I actually wear this, or if it's something that I already, already really wanted, or maybe if it proves to be useful at some point down the road. So, we'll see. That's not real gratitude. True gratitude expresses appreciation for the giver and for the spirit in which the gift is given, above and beyond our perception of the value of the gift itself. We find exactly that kind of unconditional, no-strings-attached gratitude in verse 12 of Psalm 86, where the psalmist gives thanks long before his prayers have been answered. He says, I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Not if you answer my prayer, just I will do this. The clear implication is that I will give God that kind of thanks regardless of when or how or even if my prayer is ever answered. So one more time. C is for calling out to God. A is for acknowledging who and how you are. A is for acknowledging who and how God is. A is for asking God to help you. And T is for thanking God for what God does and who God is. Notice the back and forth in all of that, right? Calling out to God, acknowledging you, acknowledging God, asking God to help you, thanking God. So God, you, God, you, God, begins and ends, though, with God. But that back and forth reminds me of, oh, I don't know, a nice conversation. Let us pray. God, we call out to you this morning, for we too are poor and needy. There is much need in our community. There are so many things, Lord, that bother us when we call out to you. There are so many things in our community and in our situation that we just don't know how to respond to. But you, Lord, you are the creator of the universe. You love all people in our communities, in our world. You know what to do. Lord, we ask your help. Show us the way. Lead us and guide us through what you have taught us. Help us to know what to do. Help us to be bold in the way that we speak about your love, in the way that we speak about our communities. Intervene in our situation and use us 
and give us opportunities to make a difference in our communities. Lord, we give you thanks for these things because we know that you have already begun this work in our communities and in us, in our hearts, and this is an ongoing thing. We give you thanks because of who you are. We give you thanks for your Son who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.